Wow, no intro, straight to it. Caught everyone off guard with the curveball. There's no countdown, there's no theme song. We're ready because NFL Week 7 is catching up to us very quickly. LVC with myself for Covers.com. This is the Circa Millions Picks Consensus Show where we're trying to get the consensus. And we finally did something well last week. We made a, a pretty bad call with New England. But other than that, we were we were spot on. But they, um, they came and took the Cowboys heavy, even with the differential in lines in the contest versus the market. So we whiffed on that one. But other than that, uh, it was a pretty good show. How are you feeling after week six going into week seven? Um. Well, I finally righted my personal betting uh, shit with a nice 5-0 and uh, Sunday, which I needed. Uh, Beautiful. Finally got on the right side of some uh, bad bounce games. But doesn't mean anything lost on Monday. Well, everybody else got to uh, gloat about Monday with Tennessee. I had Buffalo. So uh, just looking forward to this week. Just wish there was better games. It's, it's a rough week. I was chatting with someone yesterday about how the differential between teams at the top and teams at the bottom this year seems much wider than it has been in recent years. We're already seeing 14, 15, 16, even 18 point favorites on the board, but there's just a lot of really bad one and five, zero and six football teams in the league. Uh, you, You feel the same way that there's just a massive disparity between the top and the bottom. I do and I don't because I don't think the bad teams this year are as bad as some of the teams in the, in, in the past because um, my numbers will uh, uh, will will uh, will expose that so to speak because I was wondering how bad are these bad teams and they're, they're not even as close as like a Jacksonville uh, in previous years or a couple of other teams in previous years. Uh, but uh, one thing is, is is Buffalo was was trending you know much better than any team I had seen in, in years so. Uh, I think teams may be a little bit better, but you have to remember these double digit favorites were covering, you know, we were always taught not to bet double digit favorites for years. And when the stats, you know, started to come out and the book started to see these double digit favorites covering consistently, well, now we're going to make more of them. You know, it's just common sense as scoring gets elevated that, uh, you know, the point spreads and more variance uh, cause, uh, cause it to go up. Best team in football is who? Buffalo. Okay. So you're not wavering after Monday Night Football? Oh, not at all. Are you kidding me? I, I mean, I worry about their red zone defense. I mean, you, you, you can't go through the season at 55%. But that's so random and luck when we're getting inside the red zone. That's tough, right? Well, you know, I, I, I made the comment. And it sounds really stupid, but every time you're betting on your team and they're in the red zone, it looks like it's so hard to get in the end zone. And every time your team is on defense and the other team's in the red zone, it just looks so easy to get in the end zone. Walking it in. (laughs) I know it's, it's, you have that feeling too. And you can feel it like in drives when there's a team just marching down the field. You're like, we've got no chance of stopping this, especially if it's like late third, fourth quarter. And, and it's right on the number. You just sometimes you just know it's it's not happening. No, it's tough. It's tough. It really is. You know what else is tough? Week seven. Um, from a contest perspective, like you mentioned, there's all of these big favorites which tend to get ignored within the contest play for the most part. It's tough when you're thinking about getting a thousand plus people laying more than two touchdowns. It, it, it's part popularity, but it's part like what you mentioned, where we're all just so conditioned with not laying these big numbers and trying to avoid those and looking for another side. And at the same time, with how things are trending this year, it's hard to think that there's going to be a lot of popularity around the underdog. So we're looking at a couple different games this week. Are we just ready to write off these big double-digit favorites and underdogs, or are there any of them that are worth talking about for you as we might consider any of these in the top five? Um, I think uh, Arizona's worth a consideration in that group. It's maybe the only one, just because of yeah. of how good they've looked undefeated. Still, I don't know if we're potentially in agreement with them being as many people may look at from major media networks as the best team in football. As you just mentioned, you have the Bills higher. I certainly don't have the Cardinals there to top, but. I think if there's one thing everyone can agree on, it is that the Texans are the worst team in football. No Tyrod Taylor coming back this week, so they're sticking with Davis Mills. 
But boy, 18 and a half, that's that says never mind it being the Cardinals, which you never see, but that's just a massive number we don't see. It's still not high enough according to my numbers. I mean, it, what did um, you make it? I have it over 21. And it's, I mean, the way that they're scoring points, tough to disagree with that. Um, let's put it out. We're too early in the show here to jump to conclusions. So we'll have that on the side, but the, the Buccaneers at 13 uh, or the Rams at North of 14. When you, are we writing those two off? You know, I would think that maybe the, uh, the, the, the Lions have some hope of getting some love here, but I mean, you do have basically the number one offense facing the number, number 32 defense uh, in a lot of ways. So, I just don't think it can get the volume of action, I suppose. So, yeah, I think we should clip those off. All right. So we're already starting to shrink things down a little bit. So that will open the floor. Anything obvious, I guess, standing out to you? Because the one that I would say that if I had to look at the board and just kind of hone in on one, we've talked about them a lot throughout these first six weeks of the season. It has to be the Raiders at minus three. Um. Yeah, I think that that's going to be a popular choice. Uh, We've seen him in the top five a couple of times already. Now we see yeah. the Eagles on Thursday night football. They got the cover, but let's be honest, against the Buccaneers, they did not deserve to be in that game. They did not deserve the cover, but they sneak in late. So I think that's fresh in everyone's minds. And then last week with the new head coaching We'll call him a, a stand-in. That whole situation, people love to bet that angle. Um, despite the market going the other way, there was still a lot of interest in in Las Vegas from, well, we'll call it recreational players, but in general, that sort of led into now. But now you see him laying three against that Eagles team off of that win against Denver. Boy, this I, I have to think that this makes a lot of folks' cards with it being a short number. You're not on either side of the three here, so that will kind of cause some indifference but I think it's going to just give people an opportunity to look at it and say short spread, much better team in Las Vegas than Philadelphia. I don't agree with it, but people, are, I think, take that approach. Um, I, think, I think this is top five consideration, don't you? Yeah, you're using the same verbiage I used in week one. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I agree. Let's, let's We're learning here as we go. Um, all right, so we'll put that on the side again. We've got Arizona on the side as well. Anything else jumping out to you, for like top five potential, just from the card as a whole? I shamefully have to admit ignorance. Uh, this this is a really difficult. Uh, it's brutal. It's it, it, this is really. I cheated this week. I, I I I was going to prepare, so I started looking uh, thirty minutes early, and I go, okay, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to be all ready, and I'm going to have all my ducks in a row here, and I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. There's other than the Vegas, uh, it, it's tough. It really is tough. So let, I can throw another one at you because I think we're both equally uncertain here. But I think there's a few angles that we can kind of dive in here and at least talk about. So the, another one that would jump out to me is the Patriots at seven at home to the Jets. Now, the Pats did not win against the Dallas Cowboys, and the Jets were off of the bye. So – I think that that London game uh, the Jets played two weeks ago, maybe not fresh in folks' minds, but they haven't done really anything to garner a lot of attention. And I think that week two matchup between these two teams, with this being a rematch, that was incredibly one-sided for New England. And now that game was played in New York. So now we're getting the venue switch. And really, like we know home field advantage is worth next to nothing. I think in Foxborough, Average average home field this year is right around the point. For Foxborough, maybe you're giving slightly more, but I think it's generous. That game closed five and a half in week two. This is now seven. So we're, we're essentially getting the same price. Do we not look at the field as a whole here in the contest and think that it's a consensus agreement that New England, since that week two game, has shown more than the Jets? Like surely we're giving New England a little bit more of a bump here than what's showing here in the market at seven. Well, you know, it's funny how you gravitated to this game because I did the exact same thing. I did the once through, I came up with the Raiders, and then um, that New England minus seven, I thought about that at home. I think we can put that in our choice. And, uh, yeah, I think New England, New England has demonstrated uh, a little bit more trust, even though they've had some rocky up and downs with the results. But 
they're they're feisty and fighting and and uh, uh, I think that I think they're in a good spot to draw some attention. The, I guess the concern from just a betting side, or even if you think about it as a contest, offensively they're not overly explosive. And so you're thinking about like an offense that you want to back when you're laying a touchdown, you, you probably want some point potential and sure they looked okay against Dallas at the end there with that big explosive pass, but it's not really a team that's going to necessarily blow out opponents, at least from what we've seen. So maybe there's some hesitance there, but I think it's a pretty, pretty clear look in general. So yeah, I think, yeah, I think, uh, but that's, that's met with a combination of people thinking that the jets won't have any ability to run it up on them either. That, that's exactly it. So we'll put New England there on the side as well to go along with the Arizona Cardinals potentially and Las Vegas. I would I would say the only other game that stands out is potentially a big disparity between how the contest players are going to look at two teams and the differences between them. Carolina, New York, Panthers laying three on the road. That's probably going to be deterring some folks away. But it's another situation where, like, who's looking at the Giants, especially with all of these injuries and getting too excited about what they're doing. And the Panthers lose to Minnesota last week, and Darnold continues to look pretty rough. But just in terms of, like, the numbers and what we're looking at here, this seems like another game where there could be sort of a logical divide about how folks are looking at teams. Yeah, I mean, it's been it, 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 Carolina has been popular at, at the lower numbers. I think uh, that that solid three is going to attract some giants. I would think, uh, but our choices are so limited this week. It's brutal. You, then that's why I'm thinking like you're looking at a small number, you're looking at a team in Carolina that, I mean, they're 500 team, but I think folks may remember first couple weeks of the season they looked really good. The defense is still. Well, above average, they can generate pressure. Um, they've got some injuries within the secondary, but it's not its not too rough. I don't know how many people are going to look past Darnold and his struggles, but this is a one in five Giants team that's done very little against the spread. And I, I just feel like there's a decent disparity between the two teams overall. Is it is it fringe top five? Or are we ruling yeah, it no, out? No, yeah, no, yeah, it's a fringe. Uh, Carolina's on the fringe and uh... – that, that, yeah, I mean that's where it sits. We we have to exclude the Thursday game, of course. What a mess! Yeah, yeah. Thursday's Thursday's horrendous, and we may ultimately get with Bridgewater dealing with the foot and the quad injury. It may end up where we see Drew Locke for the Broncos yeah. at some point. Like Bridgewater last week was struggling. He he doesn't hold on to the ball for as he, he's not a quick guy from the pocket, but. I mean, he was holding on to it. He was missing easy throws. He's praised for his accuracy on short passes, and it just wasn't there. So there's something going on with Bridgewater. What a mess of a game that one's going to be. Um, but, yeah, I think that's absolutely ruling it out for sure from a potential top five consensus. So we've got a couple. Now we're really when it comes to other, like, short favorites on the board or, or smaller point spreads before we get into anything too severe – 49ers, Colts, is that four? Saints, Seahawks on Monday, which is interesting, is at five. And then we're looking at basically Falcons, Dolphins. I mean, Atlanta has been pounded pretty good. There's some news, at least, brewing around Miami with that uncertainty about where Tua might land. For the other short games, we'll get to KC, Tennessee in a second. But for those other short ones, any of those three potentially fringe top fives there we can consider? Yeah, I mean, you have to throw Atlanta in there. Uh, they they just have seemed pretty popular all week long, and they don't have to win by more than a field goal. But but yeah, I also worry that, uh, that that Miami could get some support that there's non-believers in Atlanta. I mean, there shouldn't be believers in either of these teams at the moment. But uh, I, I don't think people. The, what I worry about is I don't think people realize how bad Miami really has played to date, and uh, they're playing at home and they're sitting there, you know, they think about that, you know, how poorly the Falcons started off the season, just getting annihilated. And they're like, how can that team be laying points at, at Miami? So we might get a split on that one. That's, a, that's what I worry about. Before the Jets game in London, the Falcons allowed the most points in the NFL. And that was through the first 
four weeks, first five weeks. So they were they were the worst defense in the NFL, and they couldn't move the football. I mean, Matt Ryan looked 65 years old standing in the pocket. It, it was a very different Matt Ryan. They play the Jets, and everyone's like, oh, they're fixed. Are they really, though? I don't know how much we really value that win. Miami, on the other hand, like you mentioned, how bad is this team? They're a, a Harris fumble in week one away from – being a winless team through six weeks this season, this was a team like lots of folks were high on coming in, but it's been ugly to date. And they just, they can't get anything from the quarterback play. The only thing I'll say from Miami is just before we came on, there was a note. So both defensive backs, Jones and Howard are out there practicing for Miami. And then they potentially get both of their wide receiver, number one and two back. And I, I wonder how much that was ultimately factoring this move this open Miami two and a half went through the zero maybe that ultimately changed the thing but is it like are we going to see a thousand people weigh in on either one of these sides well I think potentially so because I I don't I think this line's a little high from where it's going to finish so it, it depends on when this line comes back down so if, if people are looking at uh, Atlanta minus one or pick on Saturday well, now they're going to really like the Dolphins. So it's a really, on a Thursday without having enough information, it's a really tough pick now because I think the line goes down and I think Miami become, becomes more attractive. I, I agree that if, if all four of those guys are starting, this is going to come down for sure. Um, what do you make of the Saints on the road at Seattle? They, they didn't have any offensive output with Geno until the second half which came from Pete Carroll running the football post game. He's like, we're going to run it. We have to run it. We have to control the game. It's good old Pete Carroll coming back on Monday night football. The only issue they're going up against a very good saints front seven, which they're not going to be able to run the football on. So it's like the clashing of Pete Carroll's wants and desires versus a very good defense on the other side up front that can stop the run. We've seen this number take on some professional money early in the week three for the saints turned into five that's what we're getting in the contest monday night football people are going to be fading geno smith after what they saw against the steelers well i think you you know you're fresh off of a monday night where you had the road favorite uh crash and burn so that's fresh in people's minds about laying points on the road on monday night that's very true yep and we we all grew up with the old uh, saying you know take those uh monday uh night underdogs so uh, which became untrue over time. But <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. Like I, I hate, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to say I know more than I do, but I, I this week is just so tough. I don't know what's going to happen as far as uh, is, is what people are going to think. Well, then let's get to the big one. Kansas City, Tennessee, Chiefs four and a half point favorites. And – that's pretty in line with the market. This was up to five and a half, but there was an interesting note where Hill wasn't practicing today. Joe Tooney was still not practicing today. Some other key guys not practicing for the Chiefs so far this week. The Titans with Derrick Henry running all over the Buffalo Bills. Coming into this game, four and a half point underdogs at home. Everyone saw them getting the six points at home. Cash on Monday Night Football and them able to beat what was widely viewed and still as we mentioned, viewed as the best team in the NFL by us, the Buffalo Bills. Now you get the Chiefs, short rest. What are you making of this number and how you think people may treat it in the contest? I think, yeah, I think that I think Tennessee is going to get more love here just because even if people are cognizant of recency bias on this uh, and know that they're due for a letdown, I think people are going to start to, you know, kind of put these teams closer together than they really are. And they're at home getting four and a half. That's looking pretty good. So it, interesting note from Jeffrey Benson over at Circa. This is not a paid advertisement from him, but he was just naturally conversing on Twitter. Um, I sent out after, well, I was right at halftime for Monday Night Football. I said, if the Bills played the Chiefs again, what would you make the number? And it was like the, there was almost 100 replies. The consensus answer was somewhere between Bills three and a half and Bills minus six. So we went from KC two and a half to people thinking Bills three and a half to six. Jeff from Circa comes out and he says, 
we'd make it if it was in Arrowhead, KC minus two and a half. There's the tweet from producer Brady, who's back on his game this week. And so when you're thinking about that, right, if you're going to go to a neutral field, um, which also came up in the comments, we were, we were discussing, and it was right around if KC played Buffalo, basically a pickup. And so when you think about that conversation, What happened to him? I think we lost Adam, Chris. Uh oh. Well, I can't host this show. I'm no good. <laughs> but uh, I, I know what he, his his point was basically uh, trying to compare the two and how this kind of looks out of whack. And uh, do we have him back? Was there was there an issue? Yeah, you were gone. I, I was maybe divulging too much and it was just the powers that be cutting it off. But like I was saying, so you have like the two teams where we have a pretty clear number against the same opponent within a six day span. Are people looking at that and then potentially gravitating towards Kansas city being short? I, yeah, I, 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 I you know, it's always camp. See, I don't like, and I may be wrong. I don't know. Maybe you guys are right, but I don't like comparing apples and oranges like that with with the, with team spreads because there's different. There's so many different variables involved. Uh, uh, do people think that way? Do they compare the, the that it, all that much? It is a market. Because I know I did it before. Like at the beginning of the season, I was comparing how a team was rated, but. Uh, I, I, I guess I do it once in a blue moon, but I, I don't gravitate toward that uh, correlation as often as, as you guys seem to. I like I like you guys putting us in an interesting group there. That well, there's, was, a, there, there's maybe viewed as offensive. I don't know. No, no, I'm not, and I'm not saying it. it, it <laughs> I, hey, maybe I'm the idiot. I don't know, but there's, you know, there's different styles of handicapping football where. It's not like you guys are all thinking alike, but you guys are following the same style exactly. and the same thought process. And that's just the way that you come at it. And I, and I just come at it from different directions and, and uh, who knows who's, you know, one, one, one method is going to be better one year and the other method may be better in a different year. The key is to keep the bankroll alive long enough that you see yeah. if the method actually works. And well, we're, we're still battling that one. So when we're trying to sort of start to put together a top five here. So I think we both agree that Las Vegas minus three is going to be in there. Can we make that one a pick? Yeah, let's make uh, Vegas and New England is for sure in there. Okay. So we got Vegas minus three, New England minus seven, um, Carolina, New York, Panthers minus three. We're dealing with pretty slim pickings here. for We, other we have slim pickings. We have no choice. We'll put Carolina in there. So we've got three of the five, and then we're kind of on the fringe here. So we've got the potential where or, or we're, we're ruling out the Saints on Monday Night Football despite popularity there so far? No, I wouldn't rule it out. Okay, so we've got we've got the Saints at five. We've got the Cardinals at 18 and a half uh, as a potential option. Uh, we've ruled out the other big favorites. We've ruled out Thursday Night Football. What about these 49ers? I mean, all we hear, you know, every single tweet seems to be another Colt injury. And That's where I was going. Justin Blackman now out, key defensive back in that secondary. The Colts are banged up all over the place. And they feasted off some easy competition here the last couple of weeks that kind of boosted them up from really being written off as dead. Now they go to San Francisco. That one's at four. Garoppolo... I don't know. How is he not ruled in yet? He's the only guy practicing. Like, he's going to play. I don't know yeah. if that's going to impact the number, but do you like the Niners better with Garoppolo than you do Lance? Yeah, uh, well. That's tough. Yeah, yeah, it's tough right now. It, it uh, See, I, I just don't understand. You really have to read. It's not a matter of handicapping the game. It's reading what, what people are thinking. I, I don't exactly. understand fully – what the perception that the general people have. I, I'm looking at some betting numbers that show that the Colts are getting more support, but Hey, this, this line was off at the beginning of the week. So that's why a lot of those bets came in, but the line still isn't moving off of the, where it started. 
And we've seen a toilet roll of injuries coming from the Colts. So there's just so much goofiness involved in this game. It's, it's hard to get a good read on it. I'm with you there. It's a complete mess on, on both sides, really. And I don't, I get it. Like if Jimmy G's ruled in and that becomes official, I don't know how it's not already, but like, does this go up to four and a half, five open five and a half. But was that assuming Lance? Like, it's a tricky one because that bye week was thrown in there as well. Williams is back on the defensive side for the Niners, which is huge. But uh, it's it's a tough one. And I would say the same thing is equally as difficult when you're looking at the Bengals and Ravens. Baltimore, a six-and-a-half-point favorite. Um, this game last year, when these opponents – like we were looking at these two teams with Burrow on the field. Like this was – 12, 13 for the Ravens laying it at home. And they've done nothing but look great so far through six weeks. The only blunder they have so far is that opening week loss to the Raiders where they were up two touchdowns for the majority of the first three quarters before falling apart late. But since then, they've just been on a roll. If you're looking at the Ravens at less than seven, does that become intriguing? Or are people buying into the Bengals, their expensive defense, how well they've been playing and Burrow and Chase seemingly unstoppable? I think this is going to be one of the most pick games, uh, but I, I think it's a, it's got the potential. I mean, I think you're going to get great two way action on this one. I, I really do. I think you can make a, there. There's reasons to like the Bengals here. There's reasons to like the the Ravens here, and I think it's going to be very interesting. I, you know, people want to have picks on games that they're going to be watching too, uh, potentially. I, I, th- I think it's going to be very popular, but I think it's going to be split as far as – what do you think? Yeah, I, like, I don't know if either of these are standing out enough from a handicapping perspective of getting more than 1,000 picks in the contest, which is basically the minimum we've needed throughout the course of the year to get into the top five. So you're, you're – it's significant. But, again, just with it being so split, I don't know if it's going to be popular enough where – like I'm looking at a Carolina, like – they're going to get a lot of attention. New England's going to get a lot of attention playing both of them playing bad opponents. And then, like we said, the Raiders playing like an Eagles team. Like I feel like those, those three are so easy to bet against and you're getting a pretty decent option to bet on that when you go into the handicapping angles and how people are going to look at it, I think that factors in where this, like you said, like if you're betting the Ravens, you're probably not looking at the Bengals from a handicapping perspective and seeing it as, as a bad team relative to what those other three that we just mentioned were in the same way that if you're back in the Bengals, you're concerned about how good the Ravens have looked. It's just a slight disagreement on where the price is, but I don't know if that's enough to get thousand people back in one side or the other. It's tough. It is tough. You know what? I, 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 I just think about it and I just have a funny feeling, even though Atlanta's got a lot of love early, I think the line's going to drift down and I think the dolphins at home, are going to take on some water possibly my only this is what happened last week with new england dallas to us so we we identified that dallas was extremely popular and then we identified that that line was going to close shorter than what the contest had and we were very right on both of those but then dallas still got slammed because i think people just defaulted to what they've been hearing the entire week saw the number and laid it regardless yeah, you know, after I finished making that statement, I regretted actually saying it because I realized, no, nah, that, that I, I can't buy that either. So yeah. if we would have did, if we would have had that same sentiment last week, we would have avoided missing another bet, and we would have gone, we would have swept the board. But it's like, is it a case where there's just so much in favor of Atlanta from media, from handicapping angles, and so much issue from Miami that it's just that? that consensus play that makes it that everybody knows is not necessarily right and wants to fade. I, Less than the field goal. Yeah. It, you know what? It's, I, I punt, I punt, I punt. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, that's, I, I think the 49ers are going to get played with all those in, injuries. I, I think that the, with Garoppolo playing that, that line should rise. It, it, it just – it's over a field goal. I don't know. I, I'm lost. I, I really am. So let me promote – we've got the three set. Let's let's do this. Let's put in Atlanta at two and a half just because they've been so popular. All right. And we're, we're going to do the Dallas-New England thing from last week but go the right direction. Okay. And then we're between – 
the Titans plus four and a half and the Niners minus four. Titans, Titans. I changed my mind on San Francisco. And that's where I was going to go. So it's like, which game is going to be the more popular handicap? And I think that there's such a division being created between betters and contest players on what you think about Kansas City that that's going to lead to it being more popular. Because it, people are just so down on KC based on their defense that They're going to it, we're having a hard time ignoring it, right? Yeah. And we saw what Henry did to the Buffalo Bills, which are a much better defense by all number standards. So I think that's going to be popular, although I may have financial interest in the other side, but I think that I think that Tennessee is going to be pretty popular. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our five. We've got our five. That was a tough one. We did it in half an hour, which is basically what it's taken us. But I, I think if you ask both of us before the show – um, it would have been probably both of us taking the over for how long it would have taken to get this top five settled. Well, it was nice not to have to talk about some of these games. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the bad ones. From a survivor perspective, I think it's pretty obvious that it's going to be dominated by the Rams, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Arizona. You, This is like your ultimate survivor week because you said that as a survivor player – the big favorites are your gift because you always want to go another direction because they're going to take out such a large percentage of the pool. And I think a lot of us have been waiting for this big survivor week to happen. And now to this date, really the big sort of landmines have been dodged by the majority of the survivor pool this week. They're going to be split up between the three teams but aside from just saying perhaps the obvious here, because I think it's pretty easy to be which is the most picked, is there another game on the board that we can maybe talk about without giving too much away from where we might be leaning that might provide some value to folks who are looking for a survivor pick that's not one of the big double-digit favorites? Um, what well, I, I, I wouldn't trust the Packers, I'll tell you that. I mean, people are going to save the Packers anyway, but uh, – uh, as much as the Packers should win that game, and I'm not betting either side of it, so but I just look at that game as a, anything can go awry, so to speak. Uh, you know, non -divi non divisional game, hungry, you know, road team, uh, basically ridiculed over and over and over again. And Aaron Rodgers coming off his cocky, I, I, I own you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a recipe for things to potentially go south in that game, so I. The Packers, that game, but they could just annihilate them. They could blow them out because Washington, they've got my number 32 defense, and they were supposed to be the defensive gem of the league. So, but that, uh, I, it's, it seems like unstable foot in there for back in the Packers. We got a comment from Jordan here saying, What about New England? Yeah, that was, that's exactly where I was going. Uh, New England is the pick. Uh, if you, if you don't want to take one of the big ones, I'm, I'll go a different direction. And I'll agree here. Great week to use the Saints. And road favorite, you're going to get all of that. And I think that's going to keep them kind of maybe not huge in the selections. But the Seahawks, now that – I think people underestimate how much one week of tape for a new offense and a new offensive system really matters from a game planning perspective. Geno did not look good. And Pete Carroll is coming out and openly saying that Basically, they didn't trust him, and we're going to run the football a ton. That's why this total is dropping. And like, I just I don't see Seattle having much success offensively. So I would agree there that maybe the Saints are kind of slightly sneaky survivor pick with all these big favorites to maybe avoid. So I think uh, being, it's primetime TV, and if you don't think Carroll's going to make some adjustments and 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 has a couple of things up his sleeve at least, whether he's got the personnel personnel or the talent to actually you know, make it successful. There's going to be something goofy. There's going to be, they cannot show up against the saints with their vanilla offense. They'll, they'll get crushed. Won't even be close. Yep. Yeah. Last order of business, most selected team in the circuit million contest, who is going to get the highest pick. Uh, Producer Brady was on the IR last week with a concussion. He is back, but we, we don't necessarily have the updated record nor stats, but we'll have the full update next week. For the elusive steak dinner. I do it's know three, that you three. get to lean off. It's 3-3. Three, three. 
It is 3-3. We're tied up. Okay, that is the official ruling. Uh, week seven, you get to lead off. Odd weeks you go, even weeks I go. Who's your most pick in Circa Million for week seven? I am going to not be as kind as you are. I think you would take the Raiders, but I have to take the Raiders by default because I just have no idea. I think Raiders are a good one. I'll go with another one of our top five, obviously. I'll take the Panthers minus three at the Giants. Yeah, it's uh, th- th- this week's tough. It's tough. Very difficult. So got our top five set. We talked Survivor. We've got our most pick set. That'll do it for us for week seven and everything Circa Million Contest and Survivor. Thanks very much for joining LVC and I here at Covers.com, and we'll see you back next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern.